Well, my name is uh, Jason J. Rock Houston, and this is Categorist TV. This, our guest today is uh, Little Caesar uh, lead singer Ron Young. How are you doing today, Ron? I'm good, yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and uh, this is about the third time I've interviewed. I always um, enjoy talking to you. Now, today we're talking about, this is a book, um, Judge This Book by its Cover. I got to tell you, um, I love the book. It makes for a great read. Um, the, the title, I think, is very fitting for a lot of reasons, and um We'll get into that. Let's first talk about the decision to write the book and how the um, opportunity came about. Well, you know, after doing years and years of interviews, I had so many people say that, you know, you should write a book. And yeah. finally somebody said it, and I was like, okay. And uh, the guy that, that suggested it uh, was the guy I kind of co-wrote the book with. His name is Steve Olivas. Okay. And... Um, yeah, we just we just got at it. And, uh, and how did you know Steve? Was he just a friend of yours or somebody you've worked with? Yeah, I've done his podcast like three or four times. Oh, wow. And um, we just, I felt really comfortable with him. Yeah. And he's also a licensed psychologist. So I figured if anybody could understand my twisted brain, it would be him. Yeah. So. Hey, you know, Ron, uh, again, uh, uh, poking fun at the title, like I said, I think it's very fitting for a lot of reasons. I mean, um, I mean, um, if you look at the co cover, it's, you know, um, you with all these tattoos, you know, and um, you, you talk a great deal in the book about um, you and Little Caesar kind of were, um, you know, basically judged a lot because of the look or, um, you know, you know um, oh, this is a biker band. In fact, it, it's funny. Um, one of my favorite parts of the book was talking about the band's appearance on the Arsenio Hall show and um, yeah. and the way they reacted to, you know, first of all, they tell you, okay, the, the big single that was out at the time was um, your cover of Chain of Fools. Um, we, we, we can't have you perform that because the song is too long, you know? Uh, we got we got to think about the commercial break. And then they, they were telling you, you know, you had to wear this jacket and you're like, and your bandmates were kind of egging you on. Hey, man, you always go up on stage, you know, not wearing a shirt or anything. And so you kind of like, yeah, I'm just going to be who I am. And, and, and I, I was laughing um, where you're saying one of the producers or something was just, going crazy oh my god oh my god he's naked up on stage talk a little bit about that <laughs> yeah yeah no the the director kind of lost his marbles when yeah. <laughs> yeah. we didn't do it anything like the rehearsal you know yeah i started playing the song and, you know the curtain opened and yeah. there i was you know no shirt on yeah all tattoos and yeah. in, in full display and uh yeah, they they didn't think that that was even ready for you know prime time. So prime time, yeah. I mean, and again, our city hall at that time, you know, I remember as a big show at the time, um, came on eleven o'clock at night, so it's not like all the kitties were up or anything. But um, it, it's funny that they would react that way, like they never seen a guy with his shirt off. <laughs> like, oh my god, he's naked. <laughs> yeah, well, remember back then there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of tattooed guys in rock yeah. and roll. Yeah. You know? It started to get more and more and more, you know, prevalent as time went on. So yeah, yeah, I, I understood. Yeah, and and um, I was reading too, like talk a little about once the band came off stage. Like I understand Arsenio was kind of giving giving you guys dirty looks. Did he did he say anything at all, or did anybody backstage say like what the hell you guys do that for? <laughs> well, no, I mean once we kind of did what we wanted to do, yeah. the way we wanted to do it, he was really angry. You know, yeah. this was his show, and we had no right to do that. And, yeah, you know, we just kind of did it our way. You know, but you know, again, that's that's a, that's such a rock and roll thing. I mean, I I was reading stories back in the days, like when um, the Doors appeared on the Ed Sullivan show, and you know, and and they kind of had a similar experience. And so Jim Morrison went up there, and he he did light my fire, and he was making all these innuendos, kind of his uh, middle finger to Ed Sullivan. All the sexual innuendos, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so um, that goes all, all the way back to that, you know. Um, and again, it, it's it's a memorable thing. I'm glad you included it in the book because the funny thing is, um, I I was around back then, but I don't even remember you guys appearing on our city hall. And, and it's kind of funny because if you tell the story in the book, um, another another band was originally to appear, but they didn't show up or they couldn't do it for some reason. So then then Little Caesar got called. Yeah, no, that was, it, we, we were on a quick fill-in. We were out on tour with Kiss. Yeah. And I, I forget who it was that they canceled. So yeah. they called us and we jumped on a plane, came back to L.A. to come do it off the Kiss tour. Yeah. We had a day off. And we flew into L.A. and did it and then flew right back out to get back on tour with them. 
Yeah, and, and in fact, um, I wonder if Arsenio was even aware of who Little Caesar was, or at, at, oh was no. The, no, 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 no. I, I, I think that just because he heard that we were doing an Aretha Franklin cover, yeah, yeah. well, they got to they got to be okay, you know. I don't yeah, yeah. Think he had any idea? But, but and the reason I, I reason I, I say that, Ron, is um, in prepping for today's interview. In fact, just um, as I got home from work today, I, I went and searched for the performance on YouTube. And um, what what's so funny is, is he's introducing you guys. He's like, and here's Little Caesar. Um, they're Ray Charles meets ACDC. I'm like, uh, are you kidding right. me? Are you even listen to it? <laughs> yeah, nah, you know, somebody must have handed him some notes. So, yeah, and, and again, you know, fitting the fitting title to the book, you know, Judge This Book by Cover. I think if any of those people were to see uh, Ron Young today, you know, how drastically different you, you look, the long hair is gone, and you look, you look like a, you know, an average, average Joe. Um, on the street, um, they, they would probably wouldn't even recognize you. No, no, they probably wouldn't. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what I really love about the book is it. it um, you know, I read a lot of rock biographies. Uh, you know, because I'm into rock music and that's I enjoy reading. But um, I don't read a whole lot. And when I do pick a book to read, um, you know, I got to find. I got to be something I'm interested in. And and it makes the the way the book is written, the way it flows, it really just flows really nice. Well, good. I'm I'm glad you think that. Yeah, a lot of people have, have been real complimentary that it's an easy read and it keeps you engaged. Yeah, it so, really, it's, it's true. And I, I think the nice thing, um, like um, if you're around like in the 80s or 90s, like I am. I mean, I I date to be honest, I I date myself all the way back to the 70s. But um, you know, if you were around at that time when Little Caesar was just coming out, um, there's a handful of people that know know the name Little Caesar. Um. And on that note, um, I also found it interesting where you're talking about the fact that um, Jenna Jameson and uh, her friend, one of her friends was in love with the lead singer of, uh, you know, this band, Little Caesar. Um, and and that, that must have been kind of a, a, a great feeling like, oh, my God, you know, she's aware of she's aware of Ron Young. She's aware of, you know, this band, Little Caesar. Wow, that that's quite a feeling. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of shocked about, you know. Yeah. When her book came out, this is good twenty years after our heyday, so it yeah. went all the way down. And, and literally, in the first couple of pages of the book, the book starts off with her going to a Little Caesar concert yeah. and her talking about, you know, how she had a thing for the lead singer. Yeah, I was like, and the I funny my, thing about the friends story, were calling me about it. So. I, I love how you kind of returned a favor. Said, "Well, you know, I thought if I ever wrote a book." And she was kind enough to mention my name in her book. I mentioned her name. Yeah, I'll mention hers. There you go. Yeah. Uh, how, how cool is that? And, you know, um, for anybody that's in the music industry or trying to make it, I think this is a great case study, Little Caesar. And uh, you tell a lot of great stories. I mean, um, you know, for, for one, um, you know, one name that constantly came, well, like Geffen Records. And it's kind of like, Reading how David Geffen was towards you guys, I mean, I don't know if it's fair to say that he had it out for you guys, but I mean, um, by the time he was done with you, I, I could not when I was uh, believe what I was reading about this thing called the strongman clause, basically where he let everybody else in the band when he was ready to drop you guys out of their their contract, but he decided, no, Ron Young, oh, there's this thing called the strongman clause where I think you're the one member of a band that that maybe has a chance to do anything and be successful, sir. I'm going to kind of keep you to your contract, and and I'm not going to allow you to go sign with any other label where you can maybe sell more records and kind of show me up. I, I thought, man, what a what, what a way to screw somebody, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, listen, you know, I got to give it to him. He's a smart businessman. That's why he's uh, got the millions know. that he does, right? Yeah. Exactly, the billions. Yeah. yeah, billions, better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, that's just... It's the rough and tumble world of business. At the time, it may be really angry, but, you know, yeah. and years yeah. later, I can respect it, you know. You can respect uh, it, I guess, in a way, say, okay, I made that mistake once, but, okay, he also educated you on something, you know. For sure. Yeah. For sure, for sure. And, and it's great that you, you're kind of in a position now where you can teach other younger musicians that may be trying to come up, hey, just, you know, maybe be aware of these things in case you're not. <laughs> yes, um, well, you know, the music business is a lot different now than it was back then. Uh, and record labels have a lot less power than they used to yeah. have. 
run by different people, you know. I mean, and, and um, another another cat you definitely were, some good lessons to be learned. Yeah, another cat you br brought up quite a bit was John Kellogner. Um, and what's interesting about him is if you know anything about his history, he's the guy responsible for kind of have um help white snake kind of have a comeback and make it you know here in the U.S. break out in a big way. He, he was responsible for Aerosmith's comeback in the you know 80s, but um. Interesting enough, a lot, a lot of people don't realize that he tried to, like, in the early 2000s, start up his own um, label. It wasn't too successful for whatever reason. <laughs> no, no. Well, John John likes to tell people he was responsible for bringing Aerosmith back and White Smith, Smith back. White yeah, Smith. I mean, that's the story that's been told anyway. Yeah, yeah well, that's the story he tells. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, uh he likes to, he, he takes credit for a lot of things. Um, and he's a talented guy, but he, he certainly has an ego. No yeah, yeah, see, and, and, and again, a lot of us just know what we hear and what we see. And that's one of the things I enjoyed about the book. I mean, let's be honest, like you said, he, he takes a lot of credit. And, and I think I can kind of see stuff like that now before reading the book, because for example, Every, a lot of albums that, you know, John Collider was, you know, involved with for whatever party he was involved with. Like, if you remember, he always would have on the back of the album or in the credits, would always say John Collider, John Collider. That was his kind of branding of himself. That was his little hook. Yep. Say his yeah. name twice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and and you got to you got to give it to him because, again, um, as crazy as that sounds. It's stuck in it's stuck in our heads all these years. Oh yeah, okay, that was a guy. You know, he was in all those Aerosmith videos. A, a weird looking guy with a long beard. And and again, um, finding out that you know even um, Stephen Tyler wasn't too crazy about him. But the way John talked, you know, they were like best friends. <laughs> uh, I know. No, listen, he takes credit for a lot of ACDC stuff. They won't let him be in the same room with him. So yeah, and, you know. and, and I also love reading the part about. Um, you know the, the the kind of world premiere of the new, of the Blue Murder album, and um, I, I like John Sykes and a lot of that stuff. But but I'll be honest with you, I was a much bigger fan of the '87 White Snake album than Blue Murder. John Sykes is a great writer; he's a great singer. But I just think they didn't really capture, you know, that whole band. I mean, it was a good album, but I think it could have been better. Yeah, um, you know, John's a talented guy. I don't know if he was really you know, his solo stuff, you know, yeah. and doing murder, I think he was better off as being in White Snake than he was so much yeah. on the Blue Murder stuff. See, I, I think Blue Murder was supposed to be his solo thing, but how can it really be your solo project when you got Carmine Apiece and Tony Franklin in the band? That's why the, Yeah, well, that's, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a su the super group. Super group, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love the story of kind of like you were telling, well, you know, they, they, you're in a room and they're premiering the album and and some I think it was John Collada or somebody at the label asked you, you know, what did you think? And they weren't too happy with what you thought. <laughs> no, no, I just told them that they're, you know, on the first single, I didn't think it was the strongest hook I'd ever heard. And, yeah. You know, and they couldn't believe it. And they were just kind of like, well, but the drum sounds are so great. I'm like, so what? You know, kids don't care about drum sounds. Yeah, yeah. They want to have, they want to have a memorable song, you know. And that didn't, you know, that didn't endear me too much to the to the group in the room. But yeah, and, and let, let, honest, let me ask you, you know, um, did 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 um, Little Caesar like when you guys were putting out your debut? Did you get any kind of um, similar treatment where they're having all these people that they're premiering it for? Did that not happen? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I wasn't in the room in the same way that John wasn't in the room when when they debuted the Blue Murder record. So I would, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, and what was it like for you um working with Bob Rock? Because again, um, interesting thing is like you were saying, you had David Geffen, you had John Collier, and you had Bob Rock, all these big powerhouse guys in the music industry at the time. And and because Bob Rock had just came off a number one album with um Doctor Feelgood, he all of a sudden got all this, you know power to kind of do whatever he wanted. Yeah, well, actually, the, the Dr. Feelgood record went number one while we were working with him. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. But, yeah, Bob was kind of like this, he's, he's at least with us, he was kind of strange mm -hmm. and kind of disconnected, you know? Um, and, and I don't know if he was going through some stuff in his personal life. Yeah. He was really a, lit, a bit detached, you know? Yeah. 
I should say. Yeah. Maybe you couldn't relate to all the biker dudes. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, did, did you think that um, – would you say it's safe to say Little Caesar really did kind of get um, – misbranded i mean um i imagine like a lot of people ron that you know all your life you this is your dream to kind of go in and make a record write you know write your own music have your own band um was it everything you thought it would be i mean um or did you think once you know start living out the dream other people coming into it and trying to change who and what the band was well yeah we, we kind of sensed early on that with all the hype and all the big powerful people behind us that that could yeah. be a problem Exactly. That's exactly what happened. You know, um, they they really started to try to stick all of their little yeah. prints on the band and forgot that the band is really at the core of it. You know. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, what was it like once um, Little Caesar started going out there and touring? Um, I mean, you were on the Kiss tour, so. Um, you know, and I know from being a KISS fan myself, a lot of times, you know, if a band gets out on a KISS tour, you know, it, it's, um, um, you know, it's, it's some serious, um, serious business for a band. I mean, almost any band would love to get on a KISS tour. Yeah, no, listen, it's always a, you know, KISS tour is always a major tour. Yeah, yeah. So we were, we were super excited, um, you know, to work with, you know, a legend, so to speak, uh, yeah. of the industry. So, yeah, we were super excited and, and it was, you know, it was really a great opportunity. Yeah, and and, and um, I was also um, enjoying the parts where you're talking about being on tour with Kiss. And, for example, um, while a lot of people maybe did not realize at the time, I love the part of the book where you're talking about, yeah, you could kind of tell that Gene and Paul were wearing wigs. And in fact, at, at one gig, Gene's mother even came up and was in front of everybody kind of telling, hey, Gene, why don't you put on your real, real hair? Why do you wear like, fake hair? And I, I mean, just stuff that people never were even um, aware of. I mean, a lot of times people look at pictures now and you can kind of like, yeah, that guy's obviously wearing a wig. But, um, but, but, but you know, a lot of people didn't know back then they were doing that. Yeah, and then... You know, Gene, if if he was confronted with it, he 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 yeah. wouldn't deny it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, you know, at this point, Gene and Paul, they didn't care. You yeah, know, yeah. yeah. Anybody knew they were very comfortable as who they were, comfortable yeah, yeah, yeah. in their own skin, so to speak. I mean, yeah. as we sit here, Kiss has just announced they're they're going to wrap up their career. You know, at the end of the year at Madison Square Garden. Um, they've been doing it for fifty years, so I don't think they have anything to prove to anybody. No. Exactly right. Because because you wouldn't be around for fifty years if um, you know, you if you didn't have good music. I mean, um, one thing I can say about those guys, they, they write great tunes. I mean, all, all, any Kiss song you listen to pretty much has a great hook. You know, you can sing along to it. Yeah, well, they definitely have a great formula for sure. Yeah, and, and what's interesting when you guys were out with Kiss, um, that was during the period they weren't wearing the makeup, and um, and let's be honest, a lot of people much rather see them in the makeup, but. They were able to kind of, um, you know, survive that period where, which was very interesting because you go back 50 years ago when Kiss was first starting out, everybody was telling them, you know, l really love love your guys' songs, you love the music, but you really have to wear that makeup, and, and that ended up being the thing, one of the things that people just love the most. Well, I'm sorry, which I'm saying, part of it? Know, going back to you know 50 years ago, everybody was telling Kiss. You know, we love your guys' music, but you really have to wear that makeup, you know. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and then that winds up being the most enduring thing about them. Yeah. It's, you it's, know, and yeah. the most the most recognized to the point that they go back to doing yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And um, when you were out with Kiss, did they have put any limitations on you guys? Because I I heard stories over years from people that, um, you know, they, they, would, they wanted to pick great opening bands, but they didn't want to pick anybody that would kind of. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I'll do we, them, you know. I'd say 25 to 30 percent of the nights, the tickets would say doors were at seven, uh -huh. and we'd be on at 6:45. Yeah. Um, we only got one sound check. That was the wow. first night of the tour, yeah. and then never got another sound check. Yeah. Um, yeah, we only had a third of the lights and half the PA. Mm -hmm. So you know, but again, protecting their brand. Yeah, and that's that's what it's all about, and. Um, and whose idea was it for you guys to cover the Aretha Franklin uh, Chain of Pool song? Well, that was the song we, that was one of the first songs we ever, you know, 
But when you put a band together, you got to have find something to play. Yeah, we didn't have original music yet, so we decided we wanted to be a rhythm and blues based band. And I don't know, it was probably my idea because I'm a huge Aretha Franklin fan. Yeah, to try yeah. to to try to do you know a hard rock version of one of her songs. Yeah, and, and it's just kind of stuck with us. And here's a crazy question, but you know, um, since that Aretha Franklin came out movie came out a few years ago, and she she since passed away, you guys, um, you get any more of a response when you perform that song these days, or I imagine it's probably pretty much the same as you've always done. Yeah, I don't think a lot of, you know, even to this day, there's a lot of people who don't know that that's an Aretha Franklin cover or, yeah. they, you know, yeah. we do it in a different yeah. way. And that's um, what's cool about it to me because, um, I mean, you didn't go with the obvious, um, you know, song that everybody's heard. And, um, and because you guys arranged it in such a different way, you know, kind of rocked it up a little more than what it, what the original version is. It, it, um, I could see people thinking it's a little Caesar song. Yeah, well, we that's the thing is you try to make it your own, you yeah. know, do your own spin on something, and yeah. it kind of you know shows what the where the band sort of values yeah. and sensibility. Yeah, and and I would say, Ron, um, I don't know if you agree, uh, but I think it's fair to say Little Caesar has kind of come full circle because the amazing thing is like. Um, when, when David Geffen, you know, drops the band and everybody's kind of, okay, this band is over. You, you guys come back in a way, um, I dare say, bigger and better. I mean, how surprised were you when you got Little Caesar back together and and you've seen the love the fans still have for it? I mean, th to this day, people are still coming out to seeing the band play live, you know? Yeah, no, listen, it, it, it's, it's a great compliment and we're really grateful and we're so appreciative that the fans are so loyal. And, you know, I mean, we don't have a huge fan base, but our fan base is incredibly loyal. But they're loyal. And, and I think what's interesting is um, back when you had the big machine of, you know, like a Geffen Records behind the van, um, I don't know, maybe there's a little more pressure from a label. Maybe they weren't really behind you guys, as we can kind of see from reading the book. Um, you know, they drop you, you know, pretty quickly. But, but my point is, when, when you came back, Fans were still going out to see you. Uh, and maybe the music bit industry being what it is, you know, you don't have a big um, label, but you've got a great la label behind you now, Deco Records. They may be not as big as Gap and Records, but what I love about, they really support their artists. They put out um, everybody on, you know, Deco Records. They got a great roster of artists that they really get behind, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's great to be with them, working with them. Yeah. And, you, you know, you get a lot more personalized sort of an yeah. approach. Yeah. yeah. And since uh, since Little Caesars come back, uh, again, the music industry is a lot different. You got all this stuff like we're doing today on the Internet, uh, these Zoom interviews and stuff, um, you know, having to, having to update your Facebook page and all that. What's that been like for you kind of learning learning those new things? Well, you know, it's, it's a two-edged sword, you know. Um, it's a lot of work, but on the other side of the coin, you get a direct connection right to your fans. So it's yeah, really... that's a great thing. And and you know, I I would think well, you know, it's great for maybe financial reasons to have a big machine like Geffen Records behind you. But at the same time, um, who's going to promote your band better than you? I mean, I imagine Ron Young's got to be the best um, PR <laughs> man, you know, next to next to uh, Chips. Sure. Yeah, you would think, but you also have to be careful what you say. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, or or you know the 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 guy you're currently with, um, Michael Randall, he's pretty good too. I mean, he used to he's worked with everybody from Britney Spears to yeah. So the fact that you guys still have those kind of people working with you behind the scenes uh, shows me um, there's still there's still a place for Little Caesar. Yeah, yeah, and, and I guess before we wrap it up, Ron, the best thing uh, to kind of end on is um, could you give us an update on? I know you guys are still doing live shows, but um. Any talk of new music? I mean, especially being that you signed uh, with you signed with Deco Records now. Yeah, now that the pandemic's you know finally over, you know we got to get in there and start you know greasing up the machinery again to start getting some new music out. Mm -hmm. So, and um, and this will be like the first album of new music in in quite a while. I know you've had a few reissues, but um, how excited <laughs> are you to get in there and kind of really do something new and fresh? Looking forward to it. You know, we, the last album came out in 2018. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Three years, three years of the pandemic, that takes, you know, that yeah. kind of wipes 
that right off the bat. And, and so, yeah, what's the project? Excited. What's the projection for that? Do you think we'll get a new release in 2023 or maybe next year? Well, it's already 2023, so <laughs> better get to the work, right? Yeah, I, I got you. Yeah, that's why. It, yeah. Well, well, Ron. Um, I, as always, I enjoy talking. I, I enjoy doing it this way. I started doing it because somebody, one of my friends, urged me, "Hey, you should learn how to do these." Zoom calls, and what I do enjoy about it is uh, it's quite different. And interesting thing is, um, each interview's got kind of like a, a different, um, a, a different uh, character, uh, so to speak, because there are people doing it from all over, you know. And it's been a lot of fun. So let's keep keep, keep, keep in touch, Ron. And um, I'd love to do this again um, when you do have something new out. But um, take care, my friend. And the interview we just did, I'll let Mike knows when it goes up, but it'll probably be in about a week from now. Great, thanks. Okay, take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.